Today we are going to look at a verse. It's in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Nope, yes, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. I consider this a very fundamental verse to the Christian faith. A very foundational, fundamental verse. So we're going back to the fundamentals today. And fundamentals are very important. I believe fundamentals are very important if you're trying to play a musical instrument. I don't do too much of that. I took piano lessons back in the, uh, well, a long time ago. And I think the first thing I learned was the fundamentals, things that you need to do, you know, foundation, uh, setting me up to be very successful. That didn't work out too good. But the fundamentals are very important. Uh, math, fundamentals are very important in math. Did anyone in here uh, kind of fall behind in math? You know, when you fall behind, I know I, know I did, and based on our, our meeting yesterday, I think Milan agrees with this. You fall behind, you, f you miss out on the fundamentals, you have problems later on. And I certainly did. Athletics, fundamentals are very important. Any sports fans in here? Oh, wow, good. I'm a big sports fan, and, and, uh, and uh, full disclosure, I am not a coach, but I played one when my kids were growing up. And my poor uh, daughters, God bless them, I was their basketball coach. And just looking at me, you can tell I was a really good basketball <laughs> player. Uh, I, I, I felt like I knew a lot more about baseball. And my oldest son, CJ, many of you here know him, he loved baseball. He couldn't get enough baseball. And I considered that, his love for baseball, my calling as his coach. So I started him out at a young age here at LCP, uh, the Little League here. LCP, yeah, that's what it's called. And I started him out at seven years old. And I, st I, I thought, I want him to be fundamentally sound. So I started him out. I, you know, he got his glove. I would roll him the ball, right? And he was to catch the ball like this. Ball rolls into his glove. His head is looking down at the ball. Bare hand is on the ball. And then, I, and you know, he'd catch it and just freeze like that. And I'd say, throw. And he'd pop up and throw it back to me. But we would do that over and over and over again. I wanted that to become muscle memory for him. So he wouldn't even have to think about it. He would just do it. It would just come natural. And I did this other drill with him consistently. It was called quick toss. And he was to stand like this, glove hand out. This is tough with a mic. I'd throw him the ball, bare hand on the ball. He would bring it in and throw it back, side-armed in one motion. Very important skill if you play infield, and he played infield. So catch it first, bare hand on the ball, bring it in and throw it. And I did those drills with him. Even into high school, we would revisit those drills from time to time. Well, he, got, he would get older, and I'd say, all right, let's do the, I called it the alligator mouth, because, you know, you kind of form an alligator. It never lost that title even into high school, and he'd kind of roll his eyes. You know, he kind of felt like, I, you know, I've advanced beyond this. And, I'd, and I'd, of course, I'd say, do it. You know, I'm the coach. I had this thing with my kids. I would, you know, sometimes I'd get frustrated coaching them, and I'd say, you know, guys, we, we ought to be beyond this by now. You know, I'd kind of get frustrated. And then afterwards, I'd, I'd put my arm around them, and I'd said, now, was I yelling at you out there? And they knew how to answer that. The correct answer was, no, sir, you were coaching. And I said, yes, that's exactly right. So I'm not a bad dad, I'm just a coach. So one day I was watching a, me and CJ, we were on the couch, and he was, you know, probably looking at his phone. And we were watching the Rangers and the Yankees playing several years ago. The Yankees shortstop was a guy, probably, most of you probably know, Derek Jeter, arguably one of the greatest shortstops that's ever lived. And and so we're watching this game, at least I am. I think he's looking at something else. But the, the, the batter hits a choppy, slow-rolling ball towards shortstop. This is a very difficult play to make if you're a baseball player. So Derek Jeter charges in. Charges in. He catches the ball like this. And with, he took one more step. He brought the ball in and threw it sidearmed across the infield. Getting the runner out, it was a spectacular play. But you know what I noticed? He used both, both of those fundamental things that, I, that my son was rolling his eyes when I made him do. So I stopped it. I had TiVo at that time. 
I stopped it. I rewound it. I said, CJ, look at this. And I played it back. And I said, there you go, alligator mouth. And I went forward a little further. I said, look at this. Quick toss, sidearm across the infield. Spectacular play, got the runner out. He said he did both of those things, those fundamental things we've been working on to make a spectacular play. And, and I think CJ responded something like this. He looked up. He went. <laughs> but it was still, it was still a very good teaching moment. Well, CJ went on to play in high school. He was, he was a shortstop for his high school team. And there was a big game. He was playing a game at the end of the year. The winner of this game uh, won the district and went to the playoffs as a district champion. Huge game. And so I asked him during the week, I said, how's, you know, how's practice going? And I was expecting, great, ready to go. And I got kind of a tepid answer. It's like, eh. I said, wait, wait a minute. What, what, what? What's wrong? What's wrong? What's going on? He said, the ball's slipping out of my glove. I said, what do you mean the ball's slipping out of your glove? I don't even know what that means. He said, I said, I'm telling you, Dad, the ball's slipping out of my glove. It keeps slipping out of my glove. So, I said, so you know what I did? I grabbed a tennis racket and a rubber ball, and I said, get your glove. Let's go outside. And then, whap, hit him a ground ball. And sure enough, the ball's flying off behind him every now and then, about one out of every five ground balls. And I looked at him. I said, CJ, you got to catch the ball first. You're trying to throw it before, you know, before you've caught it. So I said, let's go back. I'd hit him the ball, and I'd say, I want you to catch the ball and stay down there until I tell you, and then you can come up and throw it. And we did that over and over, and guess what? Problem solved. Now, right about now, you might be saying, why is he talking so much about sports? And I'm going to tell you why. There's three things. Three things, and it's actually about fundamentals. Three things that I want us to get from this. Number one is fundamentals are ever so important. That's one. Number two, and now you don't stay at the fundamentals. You know, they launch you into different things, but you never leave them. You know, elementary school's great. You don't want to live there forever, do you? So number one, again, was fundamentals are very important. Number two is fundamentals launch you to doing great things. And number three, as I said, you never abandon the fundamentals. You don't stay there, but you never abandon them. Number three is this. When you're struggling, so often the problem, well, what it boils down to is there's a problem with your fundamentals. So... Every one of those three things I just said are true spiritually in your walk with the Lord. Fundamentals are very important. Fundamentals launch you to great things. And when you're struggling, so often there's a problem with your fundamentals. So with that said, let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read through this verse. We're going to get to, to verse 10. That's where we want to go. But we're going to get there, by the way, of verses 8 and 9. So Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your presence here today. Thank you for your spirit. Lord, open up our hearts and minds. Help us to receive from you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, those verses, specifically Ephesians 8 and 9, uh, that is a passage that is about salvation. And according to this passage, how are we saved? Well, let's look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved. So we are saved by grace. Now, if you took that word that we have translated into the English, grace, and you looked up the, the original language, the Greek term that's used and the definition of that term, grace means unmerited favor. So in other words, we are saved and it has nothing to do with our works. 
We are saved because we received something that we didn't work for. We got something that really we don't deserve. So if we are saved, or when we are saved in the church, we are saved by grace, unmerited favor. Now, when this was written 2,000 and some years ago, they emphasized things by repetition. If they wanted to emphasize something, they repeated it. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. That's emphasis. When I was in high school, however, 100 years ago, we used this thing called an exclamation point. Some of you kids may not know what that is. Because today, y'all use all caps, right? That's how we emphasize things today. Or we put it in bold, or we underline it. Well, back then it was repetition. So what we're going to do, and this is church participation part, I'm going to go, I'm going to read through this verse until I come to a comma, then I'm going to stop. And if you hear something in there that indicates that our salvation comes by grace or unmerited favor or we don't work for it, I want you to clap when I pause. Just one clap. Participation. Here we go. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Very good. Y'all are with me. So I'm, I throw these things in to make sure people are listening. Yes, and, and you know, that, that one's kind of difficult. You know how you, you know there that Paul, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wants us to know that we're saved by grace? Because he said it. Actually, it's not difficult. That one's pretty plain. Now let's continue. Next phrase. And that not of yourselves. Yep, yes, yes. Yeah, it's not of yourselves. You didn't do it. So now that, that, that's, that's actually two times. Two times he said it in these two verses. Okay, let's continue. So we're at two. It is the gift of God. Yes, yes, it's a gift. You know what? Mylon and I went to coffee yesterday. He paid for it. It was a gift. I appreciate that. Now, if when we were done, if he just said, Danny, you owe me $4 for the coffee... <laughs> Uh, I mean, that, that would actually be a reasonable thing to do, I suppose, based on his financial situation. So that would be fine, but it would cease being a gift, right? The minute you pay for it, it's no longer a gift. So we're at three now. So it was by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift from God. Let's go to the next phrase. Not as a result of works. Four. Four times, okay? And let's just continue. You didn't work for it. Very good. We're not going to count that one, though, so we're still at four. So that no one may boast. I say yes. Yes, why can't you boast? Because you didn't do it, right? Five times. Now, do you think the Apostle Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit, wants to make this very clear that if you're in Christ, you're not there because of anything you did to earn your place. It is by grace you have been saved. This, in modern day terms, is all caps, in bold, underlined with a series of exclamation points after it. This, there is no room to interpret this any other way. But we are saved by grace, and it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with our works. Let me throw in a passage here from Romans chapter 11, verse 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Right? That's kind of what we said about the gift. If you work for it in the least bit... It ceases being grace. If you're saved, it's on, it's on account of what someone else did for you, Jesus Christ. Now, why is this so important? Five times, emphasized five times. Well, a lot of problems that I see believers, things I see believers struggling with, it comes back to this fundamental truth that we are saved by grace. Anyone here, you don't have to raise your hand. Raise your spiritual hand, I guess. I see a lot of believers that come to a place in their life where they're doubting their salvation. 
Am I really even saved? Did God really even save me? Well, part of the good news of the gospel is you didn't do anything to earn this. You, it's something that you receive by faith. Now, if there was a minimum standard of works you had to do to earn your salvation, you could never know for sure. But you can know for sure whether or not you're placing your faith in Jesus Christ. So you can know if your faith is in Jesus, if you have said yes to Jesus, you are saved. And st spend your time worrying on something more important than something that's already been done and is signed and sealed. Like who's going to win? Throw in a Super Bowl. I had to throw in a Super Bowl reference. We doubt, you know, from time to time we doubt our salvations. That comes back to the fundamentals. How many of you, and again, you don't need to raise your hand, but a lot of believers worry as to whether or not they have lost their salvation. You know? I've, I've done something so bad. You don't know me. I've, you don't know how I think, what I've done, what I've done. I've done something so bad that God can't save me. Um, well, again... You didn't earn this by doing good things. So you can't lose it by doing bad things. <laughs> you didn't, you know, that's not how you got it. So it's not taken away in the reverse. Don't, don't worry about losing your salvation, brother and sister. That's, you, you know, not to be harsh, but that's a waste of time. Okay. Uh, guilt. I know, I know believers that are racked with guilt over their past. Guilt. They feel guilt. You know, I know I'm forgiven, but I still feel guilt. And this is actually very common. You know, the last words, as Jesus was purchasing our salvation on the cross, the last words that he said that the Apostle John recorded, it, we've translated, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. That term, the, the, in the Greek, I'm sorry about so much Greek, is tetelestai. That was actually a term that was used in the financial world. Yet a good translation of tetelestai is, the debt has been paid. So Jesus, as he finished his work on the cross, the last words at least that John recorded him saying were, the debt has been paid. If you have received, if your faith is in Jesus Christ, the debt, your debt, has been paid. Now, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to throw guilt on you, but you, in essence, have no right feeling guilty about a debt that was already paid for. Right? It's not yours to have. It's like worrying about a debt, a financial debt, that has been paid off. It's, it, it's, it's not logical. And we, as children of God, who were bought at a very heavy price, have no rights to feel guilt. Let me just go, do one more. Uh, how many believers uh, feel like they're not qualified? I feel like God is calling me to do this, but I just don't know how he could use someone like me. You know, I don't feel like I'm qualified for what God is calling me to do. Well, if you have been saved, if you have, when, when you said yes to Jesus, when you received him, uh, your debt has been paid, your sins have been removed. You know what that makes you in God's presence? Perfectly holy, perfectly just God. That makes you righteous. In Christ... You are the righteousness of God. You are not guilty. So there are no degrees to righteousness. You're either righteous or you're not. You either have the right to stand before God or you don't. If your faith is in Jesus Christ, you are every bit as righteous as Danny Moore. That didn't have a whole lot of impact. You're every bit as righteous as Mylon Avery. You throw in any saint you want. Billy Graham, Mother Teresa... Uh, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So you know what? You are qualified. 
You're qualified to do whatever God, whatever God lays on your heart, which, whichever direction he leads, whatever he calls you to do or be. You are qualified. Now, I could go on and on, but we're going to move on to faith. You know, we are saved by grace, right? Now, the key that unlocks this gift that we receive that is salvation is faith. And I just want to spend a minute here on faith because I believe... A lot of us, a lot of, a lot of believers, you know, universal church, we kind of equate faith with believing. And, and, and I think that's, that's true, but it's incomplete. It's an incomplete answer. And faith is believing, yes. And believing has to do with facts, right? True or false. So, yes, faith is believing, but then when you add this other element and when you put them together, then you have faith. Faith is believing and trusting. Now, now believing is about facts, true or false, you know, whether or not you believe something is true. Trusting is about relying on something. So faith is belief and trust. Now, when we all walked into these doors, uh, you know, whether you probably didn't do this consciously, but you probably all in your head somewhere, subconscious, you believed that those chairs would hold your weight. But you didn't, you're not, you didn't actually trust the chair until you sat in it. So congratulations, you're all capable of faith because right now you're all demonstrating faith in those chairs. You're believing and trusting. I heard a great uh, illustration on faith recently. Anyone ever been to Niagara Falls? Yeah, I know y'all have. <laughs> I went with y'all. The, um, it's beautiful. That's a good bucket list item. Beautiful, Niagara Falls. Well, it, it, there's so much power in Niagara Falls and majesty. It's, it's, really, it's something that's really awesome to look at. It's, it's better in person than pictures. Now, a lot of people have accidentally, or some uh, people, I was going to say knuckleheads, and I thought, that's not very nice. <laughs> some people have actually gone in there purposefully, and you know what? Very few survive the fall down Niagara Falls. Well, I think this was in the early 1900s. There was a man that he strung out a tightrope across Niagara Falls, and he, was, he would get on there with a unicycle. And he would do these crazy tricks on the unicycle, ride forward, ride backwards, juggle, did all kinds of things. I even I understand he went out there and, and made himself bacon and eggs in a skillet and cooked them and, and ate them. And, you know, of course, as you might expect, every time he did this, a group, you know, he'd collect a crowd of people watching him over there. And so he did his thing, did his tricks, came back this one day and he said, how many of you in the group watching him, how many of you believe that I could carry someone from this end of the falls over the falls to the other side? Which I believe would be going from the United States to Canada. Everyone raised their hand after what they'd just seen. And then he said, okay, who's first? <laughs> and I don't know, but I would wager a considerably fewer amount of hands went up. That's the difference between believing and having faith, adding trust to it. Well, saving faith you know, is you encountering Jesus at some time in your life, whether it's through preaching, personal evangelism, whether you encountered him in a dream, reading scripture, you know, encountering Jesus and saying, yes, I trust you with my salvation and I trust you with my life. You are trusting in him and him alone to get you to heaven, and you're trusting in him on how to live as you walk through this life. It's like just saying yes to him and giving your all to him. That is faith. Now, when you put your faith in Jesus, this doesn't make you perfect. You're still going to struggle with the flesh, flesh that has lost power. But, you're, you know, you'll, you may still have make mistakes from time to time. But you know what it does make you? when you receive his payment to die on the cross, it makes you, in God's judgment, in, in his perfect judgment, standing before God, it makes you righteous. Amen. It makes you perfectly not 
guilty, if that's a term I can use. You know what else it makes you? It makes you prepared to launch to great things. So we are saved by grace, 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 grace. And it's, you know, it's not you, it's not you. It, well, let's do it like this. It's not your works, it's not your works, not your works. You get it. Five times, it's not about you, it's not about your works. That causes your salvation. And then we move on to verse 10, which is very interesting, because then he says, now it's time for works. Interesting, isn't it? You would think that, or wouldn't you think, that if works was a requirement for salvation, that God's people would work more? You know, we would think that, wouldn't we? I know we would think that. I know we're prone to think that. You know why I know that? Because every man-made religion that I know of has that in there. <laughs> you have to work. You have to earn it. You have to Lift yourself up to a certain level that makes you acceptable to the God with a, with a small g for your salvation. But the truth is, the truth is, that your works, good works, are a very important part of your salvation, but they have nothing to do with causing it. In other words, you have been saved to do good works. Let's go on to verse 10 now. This is where we're trying to get. I told Mylon I'd get you out of here uh, by kickoff of the Super Bowl. <laughs> so remember, grace, 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 grace. Then verse 10, for we are his workmanship. I'm going to stop right there. This is your last Greek lesson. Now, don't go out here after this and say, how was the sermon? That was all Greek to me. I don't want to hear that. That word workmanship, you can also, that can also be translated masterpiece so we could a good translation would be for we are his masterpiece uh, you are very unique there's not another like you you have been you know, what else do we have to say about a masterpiece you have great worth right and you have been handcrafted by God for a purpose and let's go on and 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 see what that purpose is. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. Again, you have been saved to do good works. Your salvation prepares you to do good works. It's expected of you, child of God, that you will do good works as a result of your salvation, not as a cause for your salvation. When you were saved, when you, when you said yes to Jesus, when you, when you trusted him with your salvation and with your life, you know what happened there? We've already talked about sins, sins forgiven, sins gone. Washed clean. The debt has been paid. The sin debt has been paid. Nothing is owed anymore for your sins. In other words, you became a clean space. You became, became clean enough that you have become the sanctuary of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. You are clean enough, sinless enough, that God's spirit lives within you as if you are now his house. You are his house. You are the sanctuary now of the Holy Spirit. You now have a relationship with all-knowing, all-powerful God Almighty and his spirit. He can now guide you. You can hear from him. He can teach you. He can illuminate your mind as you read scripture, as you hear preaching. He can convict you. I think God convicts us today of our righteousness. This isn't who I am. He can lead you now because you are clean and he is with you. He comes alongside you and he comes upon you to empower you to do anything that he has called you to do. And this is a result of your salvation. 
We can't say this about anybody who has not said yes to Jesus, right? He empowers us, equips us, enables us to do everything that he commands all of us to do. You know, we receive him, we receive his love, and then because we have received it first, we're able to give it. If I ask Joseph to borrow a billion dollars, he's thinking about it. You know what? He might even really want to give me a million dollars. Let's not say, did I say borrow, give me a million dollars? A billion. We said a billion. Okay, so let's get this straight. You're going to give me a billion dollars. Right. Right. Now, he may really want to do that, but he's unable because he's never received a billion dollars. You can't give something that you haven't received first. So the things God calls us all to do, love like he loves, we can. We are equipped and empowered to do it because we've received it first. We can forgive like God forgives because we have received perfect forgiveness so it's there for us to give. We can be holy, set apart from sin because we have received his holiness. His holiness does reside within us. It's there for us to to. To give, it's there, it's, it's there for us to become. And you know what? He can empower to you, you to do anything that he individually calls you to do. Any function that he gives you in the body of Christ, you are also equipped and empowered to do in Christ. So we have empowerment as a result of our, of our salvation. We have the same power that Jesus had when he did what he did walking this earth is with us and in us. We have this power. We are empowered, equipped, and you add that to the very thing that brought us into the kingdom of God to begin with. When we said yes to Jesus, I like to kind of picture Jesus as a door based on one of his parables. And when we walk through that door, we're in the kingdom of God. And what enables us to walk through that door is faith. When we believe and trust in him, remember, we're already empowered. And by definition, our faith suggests that in our soul, we have already agreed that I am going to, uh, you are going to be my Lord, and I will follow you wherever it takes me. So we've agreed that in our soul, and we are equipped and empowered to actually do it. You know what this means? It means you have been saved to do good works. Amen. You don't need to worry. This fundamental truth here, you're not going to lose your salvation by works. If your faith is in Jesus Christ, you are saved. And he is our Lord. You know what? Oh, sweet Jesus. Think about this. Think about what Jesus has done for us in this age we live in right now. By his work, he has taken us from the old covenant, which I, when I read it and look at it, what was required of God's chosen people, I, I kind of sum up the old covenant in do this or else. So he's taken us from the covenant of do this or else and ushered us, us into the covenant, which is do this because it's who you are. Yes. Yes. Do this because of what I have done for you. Respond to me in this way. It's as if we have wa walked into this new covenant, walked into school. This is kind of a fantasy of mine. The principal calls me and Danny, come in here. Slide something across the desk, a piece of paper. I pick it up and look at it, and it's my report card for the end of the year. Straight A's, straight A pluses, perfect. Perfect attendance, perfect conduct. Do you remember when they used to give you grades for conduct? <laughs> perfect academically, perfect attendance, perfect conduct. This is your report card, Danny. This is who you are. It's done. Now go out there this year and act like it. That's the new covenant that we're in today. So, brothers and sisters, 
dare I say, fellow church members. Are you in a slump, a spiritual slump? Do you find yourself wrestling with your salvation? You know, am I really even saved? Do you find yourself wrestling, uh, worrying about things you've done in the past? Are you racked with guilt? Are you wondering if God can really use you? Well, if that's you in any, uh, any of those things I mentioned, or anything else, perhaps, there's so many things we can say this about. Perhaps it's time for us to, for you, to revisit the fundamentals. Go back to the fundamentals, and you'll find, if you are in Christ, that you have been saved, brothers and sisters, to do good works. Amen? Let's let's pray together. Father God, thank you. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you have done for each and every one of us. The price you paid, thank you for grace. Thank you for the free gift of salvation. Lord, I pray for each person here, if there's that, that you would meet them right where they are. Help them to hear and consider what you would have them hear and consider. And Lord, for all of us, help us to receive as fertile soil. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.